Hi. Hello again. Um, thanks again for regrouping. I hope the snacks were good. Um, for those of you who are joining us for this second talk um, after or who weren't here for the first one, uh, we're gathering today on the sacred lands of Rundri. People of the greater Kulin nation, sovereignty on these lands have never been ceded. And we're privileged to be held by the traditions of storytelling, knowledge sharing, care, exchange, and vulnerability that has existed here for a long time before all of us. I pay my respects to the elders and custodians of these lands, past, present, and future, and extend this respect to our First Nations colleagues and friends in the room with us today. So welcome back. We are here for the second talk for the day, which is uh, an intersection of public and private space. Um, where does private space end and public space begin? What does it mean to exhibit and exist in a public space? How does care translate in these spaces? The artists exhibiting in the 2022 GSPF have responded to this curatorial rationale exploring softness, care and vulnerability. And we will be speaking with three of the artists uh, joined by the wonderful Chris Parkinson, who will be facilitating this conversation. A little bit about Chris. Chris Parkinson uses photographic processes and practices to remix the visual vocabulary of ur urban environments. His compositions are indebted to seriality and abstraction, rhythm and effect. Chris's socially engaged practice sustains a strong connection to the region. He has published a book in 2010 called Peace of War, street art from East Timor and have, has worked with artists and artist collectives from East Timor and in Indonesia since 2005, founding a collective called Animatism in 2010. He is currently completing a PhD at the University of Melbourne on collective art practices and public cultures in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, Dili, Timor-Leste. Chris also works at the city of Yara as a youth arts officer since 2010. Um, the artist in residency program for emerging artists. Some of those artists are here with us today, so welcome. Um, and has, a sustained, has sustained a long relationship with Gertrude Street Projection Festival. Chris is on our creative advisory committee as well. Um, and has had some very beautiful moments as part of the festival's programming since 2014. Chris has also shown his work, his own work in the festival since 2012. Which I didn't know about Chris. Um, and also teaches a breath unit at Unimelb um, on the history and theory of street art and graffiti. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank so excited. you, everyone. Um, and I'm just going to quickly introduce the three artists as well before I hand over to Chris to um, take us on this journey for the next hour. I'll start from with you, Spencer. Spencer Harrison is a visual artist whose work distills color, form, and space into ordered abstract structures that reflect on our lived urban experience. His visual language draws on the world around us, referring design, architecture, science, and the built environment. Within his works, Harrison explores tensions between minimalism and maximalism, order and chaos, contemplating the role these forces play in the modern world. Employing a range of methodologies of making across painting, digital video, sculpture and installation, the works that Spencer creates question the nature of abstraction and its relationship to contemporary life. Thank you, Spencer. Um, Freya Pitt, who is an artist based in Melbourne, Nam, and her practice spans across video, projection, painting, performance and installation. Freya's exhibitions have included the Melbourne Festival Arts Art Trams Project and White Night Melbourne. Freya holds a Master's of Art in Public Space from RMIT and a Master of Fine Arts from VCA and also makes art to explore the convoluted ways where each, for each formed within socio-historical structures. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Freya. <laughs> That's uh, a mouthful. How exciting. Um, and Sal Cooper in the middle. Hi, Sal. <laughs> Sal is an interdisciplinary artist who has been practicing for 15 years with a focus on screen-based works. Her wide-ranging cross-platform practice covers independent filmmaking, hand-drawn and stop-motion animation, installation and performative events. Uh, Sal's work utilizes an observational language that gives expression to deliberate misunderstandings, absurd irregularities and comic abstractions. 
she employs complex and refined production techniques to pr project a lyrical depth and meaning onto objects and landscapes, fully exploring the imaginative possibilities of the ordinary world around us. Thank you, Sal, and welcome. Thank you. I'm going to ha uh, pass this mic on to you, Chris, and get out of the way. Thank you so much, Priya. And thank you, everyone, for joining all of us today. Uh, just to reiterate my respects to the Wurundjeri people, um, and I acknowledge um, elders and emerging participants that might be with us today. And we acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands that are unceded of the Wurundjeri people. And as we sort of get into this phase that I think is really <coughs> interesting in the world, where systems are collapsing and talking today about the soft pulse, perhaps it is a hard pulse that we can start working towards a greater collective consciousness on reconciliation um, and the dismantling of some of the power structures that prohibit, I guess, the voices of uh, Aboriginal Australians to be far more engaged with public life. Um, and I welcome Spencer. Sal and Freya to a conversation today, a soft pulse conversation perhaps about public and private space. Uh, the festival has a really, really, I think, dignified and complicated relationship too with public and private space within Fitzroy. But I want to begin by asking you, and we'll go perhaps in this logical order here, beginning with you, Freya, about your approach to the curatorial rationale of a soft pulse? Uh, yeah. I think it didn't actually... A soft pulse kind of emerged out of discussions that were more ongoing um, and I found that a useful uh, approach at a midpoint, but I think it... I can't remember what it began with, but it was, it was a bit more generally to do with vulnerability um, within the public space. And my work is a... I framed it um, as a performance lecture about value in old master prints that sort of devolves into... Uh, at points a diatribe or at points a bit of a midlife crisis about being an artist and um, so I guess drawing the vulnerabilities that are, are quite personal <laughs> at points um, into a more performative or generalised performance to public um, and I guess in terms of the soft pulse I did end up uh, doing it, it's kind of iterative, so I or she starts the, tra keeps trying to start giving the lecture in a more together sense and then devolving again and then she comes back on, on frame and starts again and then kind of falls apart again. Um, so in terms of the pulse, I guess that's where I was coming from. Nice, lovely. Thank you, Freya. And Sal, what about for you uh, responding to a soft pulse as a provocation? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I also created the work I made uh, in response to the initial brief, which was around, what was the term? Radical softness. Yeah. So the phrase, the pulse, the soft pulse wasn't a part of that then and uh, it does add this kind of different and obviously kind of rhythmic quality to the notion that wasn't, uh, that I hadn't interpreted in the first instance. So, um, and I did actually think of swapping out my video completely when I heard the phrase, a soft pulse, um, only because I happened to be in possession of some footage that is a, um, what do you call it, echocardiogram of my own heart. And in it, it's really great to look, I think it's great to look at. It's my heart, right? <laughs> I would. Um, there's a beautiful rhythmic quality to it, as you would want there to be. <laughs> um, but there's a, a beautiful kind of prayerful thing where these uh, valves inside your heart I'm going off on a complete tangent here, sorry. Right. Um, 
the valves inside your heart, when you look at it, it's a little loop, right? Um, and I had to talk the people at the hospital into giving me a copy of this uh, piece of movie footage because, of course, they don't give it to you. Um, but they did. And you can see the valves inside the heart, that happens to be my heart, kind of, uh, they look almost like they're applauding in slow motion. There's this kind of clap, right? It goes on and on and on. It feels a bit like a clap of, hurrah, I'm alive, <laughs> hurrah, I'm alive. And there's another aspect, there's a different angle to the same footage that looks prayerful. It looks like the valves inside the heart are kind of bowing and then raising and bowing and raising in this kind of meditative way. This interesting thing. And that's what I thought of when I heard the term a soft pulse. Um, I thought, oh my God, I've got to use that instead. I resisted that notion, however, and stuck with the original, uh, the original, original video, which is a kind of um, slow motion, balletic, uh, kind of savage dance between two dogs, um, which is full of love. My uh, idea was that it does look savage and it looks uh, ambiguous. And also indistinct. I wanted it to look indistinct and ambiguous, which hopefully it actually does. Um, so that's what I, that's what I made. But they do also. There's a, a circularity in the way that they are moving and engaging. Correct. Which yeah. is, it could be interpreted in some ways as a soft pulse. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it could be interpreted <laughs> in some ways as a soft pulse. Thank you. <laughs> And yes, it, like any kind of animal or living movement, it has a rhythmic quality to it because it can't not. Um, there's other layers of meaning in there as well. I won't necessarily go into them unless somebody asks me to. Uh, yeah. That idea and I think that sort of dichotomy of the savage and ambiguities I think has a lot to sort of say in how it's represented and reflected too within public space, right? Because public space is a space that's in contest with what itself as well, I think. And the idea of the savage and that ambiguity of what is neat and what is, you know, not savage, I think is a really interesting thing to explore as represented in a space such as public space that can be quite savage and that is littered with ambiguities as well. Indeed it is, yeah. And, you know, the dogs, there's a dog uh, in there that is, there's a bit of a kind of passing reference that, uh, like I say, I didn't uh, kind of include in the artist statement, which is about uh, something in Inferno and Dante's Inferno. There's this point in the forest, the dark wood, uh, there's three beasts that Dante encounters before he goes down into hell. Um, and one of the three beasts is the she-wolf of incontinence. Um, and in that sense, so one of these dogs is a kind of she-wolf, right? Um, incontinence in this sense, meaning not uh, the contemporary meaning of incontinence, but an incapacity to control one's own emotions is in that sense what incontinence means. Um, and this is considered to be uh, one of the three, I don't know, devilish possibilities of humanity or um, negative possibilities or ways in which your personality might manifest that is undesirable is to be in the clutches of the she-wolf of incontinence. Wow. Mm. Cool. <laughs> 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 That's lovely, Sal. Um, and Spencer, to you, you know your work pulses in many different ways with such bright, vivid colours and this sense of you know, in your words, exploring and otherness as well. Um, can you talk us through what sort of your points of inspiration were for the development of your work for this year's festival? Um, yeah, so it does pulsate. There's a very rhythmic quality to the video work, but the part of the curatorial rationale that I kind of connected to um, conceptually was the around softness and... Um, just growing up as a as a queer male, you know, you kind of get teased at school and get called soft and it kind of becomes this thing of, um, you know, to be soft is to be bad. It's, you know, it's um, 
related to the feminine and, you know, all this horrible toxic masculinity stuff that we kind of live with in our, in our culture um, and that, yeah, is very kind of relevant as a, as a queer individual. So this work is kind of like one of the, my first uh, steps into kind of exploring my queer identity through kind of abstraction and colour um, and through my kind of readings, just reflecting on what colour means within Western society and we kind of have this fear of colour because it has these kind of relationships with um, femininity and queerness and otherness and, you know, it, you know, within architecture, we don't put a lot of colour in, in, in kind of modern architecture. So I'm trying to kind of like combat that through kind of just very expressive colour, kind of rec reclaiming those, those things and, um, you know, that's been kind of part of my own personal journey as a as a queer person, being becoming comfortable with my own softness and um, yeah. So my work's very colourful, and I kind of wanted to bring the colour to the architecture of the street. These kind of like hard forms of the street um, as a as like almost like a giant flag for all these individuals that are maybe clumped within that category of of otherness um, and yeah and use celebration as a way of um, resisting all the all the the baggage that that comes with that but um yeah it's something I kind of want to explore more because I think color has a lot of uh, can convey a lot of emotion as well which I think relates with with softness <laughs> yeah you touched upon architectural and the sort of hard edgeness of architecture and stuff. What is, what does it look like for our public spaces to have perhaps a softer edge to them? What are the constituents of that? What needs to change perhaps? Well, I would love to see more colour in our urban spaces. Just in general, I've travelled to some other cities in the world where kind of colour and art is embraced in the urban environments and, um, yeah, it creates a different mood to the the, the towns and the, and the cities. And, you know, it's very dominating being in these kind of like concrete environments where everything is so rectilinear, grid-like, and you kind of feel like you're a cog in a machine. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like, I don't know, talking about softness, I don't know, break, yeah, breaking up the the urban environment with some softer forms might be something nice to consider in urban planning. <laughs> and I, th I mean, I think one of the beautiful things that the festival does year in and year out, year out is transform some of these spaces. And you know, Melbourne's predicated on that hodl grid, so it is very structured. And that grid was built around almost the management and surveillance of people more so than it was a lifestyle choice. So. Things like this festival, I think, start to shine a light, if I can use that pun, Priya, uh, on, you know, changes that can be made to, to that grid, you know, and that hard-edged lived experience that happens here, which I think in ways Graf does as well. And I might argue, if I would be so bold to suggest that it has a soft pulse, depending as well, it's a pretty subjective experience of it because I don't mind it. If it's blaring in your face, I get other people dislike it. But it has this pulse in the city that kind of asks us to reconsider how spaces are used. And I think that's a really important thing and an important thing that this festival does as well. Um, I want to loop back to a contemporary understanding of incontinence, Sal, if it's mm -hmm. okay with you. But also bring Freya into the conversation. A few years ago, you painted in Northcote. Um, and you suggested that art isn't always glamorous but does love to serve its community. I want to ask you about showing your work as part of this festival in this community and what that brings for you. Ooh, a lot of strains to tie together here. Um, I did once paint the Northcote public toilet block, um, was, was what was being referenced there. Uh, 
in this community, I don't know, I guess putting some of my vulnerabilities around being an artist and feeling outside of that community often and um, and I guess the more structural elements of s the way those things are approached socially. Um, and I mean, I guess both on a very basic social level, but also in terms of the more um, institutional structural elements um, that maybe play out in some of these areas. I don't know. I think I just, I just like talking to people on the street and it's not as specific to this street, I guess, this work, other than it does feel like a site. I have shown works, very different works in the festival over the years. And I think I'm in a fairly different place in my practice now. So it does feel a little bit like I'm talking back to myself over iterative attempts <laughs> to kind of find myself or figure out what I, what I want to do artistically. Um, so like a lot of my work, maybe it is um, just a very narcissistic attempt to talk to myself yet again. <laughs> Excellent. We all need to. And Sal, for you as a sort of member of this community as well, uh, working in this space, working in Fitzroy on Gertrude Street, which I'm sure you've seen undergo a number of changes over the, sort of over the years, how is it? Is this your first time as part of the festival? Excuse my ignorance. No, it's my second. Second. When was your first? Um, a couple of years back. I'm not sure. All that COVID intervention has made things a little fuzzy. <laughs> so maybe it was the last actual one. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 something? 2018? 2019? 2019. 2019. Yeah. 2019. That sounds good. I'm not good at counting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I had to work in there then. Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah. So is it... Uh, source of, you know, some sort of parochial pride to be involved in a festival and to have this festival within this sort of locality for you? Parochial pride, no, I don't think I have that. Um, there is a deep familiarity. I know that uh, in the previous talk there was some reference people were making, I think it was in relation to animals, about tender relationships. Um, I definitely have that with uh, this part of the world, mm. yeah. Or I like to imagine that I have that or I try to invoke that in my work. Um, but yeah, I've been around these parts for some years. So it's deeply familiar to me and also deeply strange. Mm -hmm. It continues to be, yeah. yeah. This, sorry, this space being completely strange? Or? Um, yeah, this yeah. part of the world. Yeah. Yeah, like I'm really interested because Gertrude Street's history as being such a, you know, pivotal part of, I think, an Aboriginal rights movement and civic movement here through the 60s and 70s and now as a space that's undergone such gentrification and change, the idea of the publics that are in Fitzroy and particularly that gather around Gertrude Street are really interesting because it isn't just that gentrified kind of uh, masses and an art crowd necessarily. We have very prominent public housing that is also on Gertrude Street. And, you know, part of my little prelude there earlier about some of the dignified responses that the festival has had, but perhaps a kind of uh, interesting relationship with public and private in that. Atherton Gardens housing estate has been used on a number of occasions as a canvas for projection and you kind of have these private lives in this private context all of a sudden spooling into a public space and I find that's a really interesting tension too around this festival as well um, because whilst it is public facing it also involves the engagement with a lot of private kind of organisations and cafes and you know businesses and stuff like that so it straddles both spheres of the public and private 
really nicely, I think. Um, and I guess within that aspect, Sal, the iniquity of this area really allows that perhaps or fosters that to happen, or at least perhaps its history has softened the landscape to allow these things to happen. I'd like to imagine it has. I can only speak of my own experience there, really, I think. Uh, and I have got a lot of experience around the area of Fitzroy, having lived there a lot. And I guess, like lots of people, if you've lived in Fitzroy, you probably lived somewhere pretty small. Um, you, by necessity, lived some of your life in the public space um, because there aren't backyards and, you know, acreage and other places to be. Um, if you've lived in Fitzroy, you've probably lived in shared accommodation and you probably didn't really like your housemates <laughs> as well sometimes. And um, You've been in these circumstances that have put you on the street to live some of your life. Um, and my own experience of that is such that uh, the, 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 the environment around here has actually leached a whole lot of meaning out of me. I'm not going to say it the other way around. Um, it feels that way so that there are kind of stories infused in the built environment, in the configurations of uh, trees and buildings and edges and power lines and all that kind of stuff that you see. They're, um, they're full of narrative. Um, mine being one of, uh, and, and not very important, one of millions, I suppose, or at least hundreds of thousands. Thank you, Sal. Um, and Spencer, I kind of uh, am interested in this idea of yours, of ref your work reflecting a sort of lived urban experience as well, um, but also interested in your sort of forays into working with public space and working in public. This is not your first time you've been painting murals around the place here in Fitz, or well, Collingwood, I think, in the past as well. Um, and I believe recently in Ballarat, you did some work in the shop front. What is that transition for you from moving from a more institutional gallery space and engaging with public space? Um, I, I really love it because it's just, a, it's a completely different experience working as an artist, working in public space and um, it, it's something I cherish a lot is because you sometimes, you know, when working within in institutions, you're kind of preaching to the converted, um, you know, it's a lot of art people come to those shows and there's just a bit of a feedback loop. Whereas when you work in a, in a public space, you're, yeah, you're dealing with such a broad width of people that are, that live in areas or traveling through them and, and you get to just have interesting conversations and you, your art can kind of connect in such different ways. And yeah, one of my most kind of treasured memories is um, working on this large mural in Peel Street Park just down the road. And I was there for about a week working every day from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. And um, the, you know, the residents and people that lived in that area, there was like people that were sleeping in that park that were sleeping rough and you know, I would get there and they would just be kind of like packing up for the day and then the, and then the you know, the yuppies would come down with their dogs to, and I kind of got to see this like whole cycle of this public space um, while I was in my cherry picker, like up on the building. But then in my breaks, I'd get to like chat to people in the, the park as well. And it was just, it was like, I really kind of got to connect with that park and the way that people used it in, for so many different reasons that, I wouldn't have seen if I'd just been there for a, a short visit. And so, and then on the other side of that, people watching the artwork emerge as well was, was a very, and like talking to them about, you know, this contribution to their public space. And then that mural was up for about five or six years and it had a kind of ongoing um, impact and connection with the people around it that lived across the road from it because it was, you know, they'd look out their window and they would see it. Um, and yeah, it's like, I don't know, I feel like very connected to that community now, um, just from having that experience. And it made me want to kind of do more of that, which is, yeah, not a common thing, I think, for a lot of artists to work over a 
longer period of time in a public space. And I think it's something that I want to try and do more of. And yeah, this projection festival is kind of another step in that direction. And it's been really great just seeing the public interact with the works in different ways and, you know, eavesdropping at them, what they talk about it and stuff is, is very fascinating. <laughs> um, yeah, like um, I, for one, you know, celebrate this return to the relational. I think that the last couple of years has kept from us and there's been significant changes, I think, in both how we experience public space, what we perceive public space to be, our private spaces have become to a degree because of a digital public, a public space as well. So there's this really interesting conversation and shift going on in the post-pandemic context around this stuff. But Freya, uh, for you and your work, how, I mean, I'm, you know, you've sort of always presented in public. Is it a natural platform for your video? No, which I think I'm coming to think that maybe it isn't and maybe that's what I've been struggling against. I initially always uh, felt really uncomfortable about the, as Spencer was mentioning, I guess the kind of closed circuit that the art world can feel like um, and particularly if you don't feel integral in that, it, you, you, I guess that much more aware of it maybe. Um, and I think that's why I started showing work in public space and I was desperately trying to make things that I'm really focusing on narrative as a way to connect with people and ha create relationships. Um, and I don't know, it's always been a bit of a battle for me, I think, <laughs> like with soft and beautiful moments in it. Um, but maybe the battle is just too many voices within myself. Yeah, I don't know that because I have come to a point, I think, where my practice is so focused on me, um, which, and I came to that not, I didn't want to have a, a practice like that, uh, but I just realised that the ways that I was trying to engage other people, I kind of needed to be the medium. Um, and so I don't, quite know where that sits in terms of the relational side of public space anymore. <laughs> um, and I guess in this one it kind of works because I'm very much, and I usually am trying to speak outwardly, um, but I guess a lot of the dialogues and narratives are conversations that I am having with myself internally. So it is an an odd one, <laughs> but I don't know that that would change in terms of if you're calling it a dichotomy between public space and then gallery kind of spaces, I would obviously, I think they're difficult to class <laughs> as public or private, um, but I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh, I don't think that there's a difference between the way that I engage in either of those spaces. I think I'm always just trying to talk to whoever's looking at it. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Um, and Sal, I guess I kind of am interested in your, again, I keep having this sort of, I haven't got a vision of it, but I've definitely, it has evoked something in me, savage ambiguity and stuff. But where this tenderness that you talk of through kind of quite uh, primal activities between animals and stuff. Where, where did that germinate, that idea for you? I'm having a big think, as you can see. Um, where did it germinate? I think, do you know, it's an interesting part of my practice because a lot of uh, what I do involves uh, the process of animation. Uh, I'm not ex exclusively an animator, but it is uh, a process that I uh, utilise a lot within my art. And that at its core, at its heart, is uh, an exercise in trying to imbue uh, life uh, into non-sentient 
things, um, be they drawings or uh, objects uh, or puppets or lumps of plasticine or pencils or bottle tops or anything. I'm very interested in um, squeezing emotion out of them. <coughs> uh, that's my job. And so that it's a sort of reverse process in a way because the medium then informs my uh, my rationale. It probably should be the other way around, but over the years, that's what's happened. Is I have it's been a kind of a developmental process where I've realised that that uh, particular means of creating work is uh, emblematic of something that I wish to. Uh, I wish to embody in other ways, which is to infuse the uh, built environment or whatever non-sentient thing I can get my hands on with emotion. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. And that, I mean, in embedding that built environment with emotion, Spencer, you do, I think, really beautifully, again, subjectively through colour um, and through shape and form as well. Was part of your approach to your work to not just add colour but to restructure some of that hardness that you kind of mentioned of the built environment? Yeah, so, yeah, I kind of, even though I, I think a lot about the urban environment having, like, lived in this kind of area for a long time and, you know, influenced by a lot of those hard forms and um, so when I kind of say I'm, like, repurposing the urban environment. I guess it's similar to you with, you know, picking out these materials, but my materials are kind of more like the forms rather than the, you know, physical materials. Um, so I'll, I'll pick out the forms and try and reuse them um, in different ways to kind of make people notice the forms a bit more, but then also um, maybe subvert them in different ways. So. Yeah, in this case, I took the forms of the building and used them as kind of starting points for the animation to kind of paint the colour onto it, onto the building. Um, so it was, it was almost like painting a mural for me, which is kind of my background more so than the video works. This is kind of like a new area for me that emerged out of not having access to public space and studios during the pandemic. I kind of started work, working digitally. So... Yeah, I was kind of like, I'm kind of painting the building, but with moving paint, <laughs> um, which is kind of nice because you're bringing time in as another element as well, which is maybe relates to the pulse as well, kind of ticking away. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of, it's interesting, yeah, seeing the work myself this weekend, um, how it kind of affected the architecture and also the scale that it, creates the scale of colour um, and light as well. Like it kind of glows back off the building, kind of into the street um, and the shadows and things, you know. It's very different from, from the experience I had on the computer screen, which is like a tiny little, you know, preview image this big <laughs> that was all perfectly crisp and clean. And now there's like the shadows of a tree and um, there's some great graffiti tags on the windows that are like silver and reflecting the colour back off it and they kind of change within it. So there's something interesting as well about working in the public space where you can't control all the elements as well, which is which is interesting. So it's a collaborative process in some ways, um, collaborating with the urban environment. Um, you have to kind of give up a little bit of control and see what happens. <laughs> but with such a measured you know, perhaps practice that you do have, is that a hard thing to give up, that control within working in this urban it environment? It is for me a little bit because I'm a little bit of a control free. <laughs> um, was in like, I'm very kind of structured in my work, but I'm trying to find ways to open up a little bit. Even like just handing over my file and letting someone else install the work was... Um, you know, an act of faith in itself, <laughs> um, which is, they did an amazing job of, of installing it all. But um, yeah, you know, it was, it was, I was very interested to see how it was all going to turn out. And 
um, in some ways it kind of yeah, surprised me with yeah, these new elements to the work that I hadn't envisaged, which um, is nice and I need to encourage myself to be open to more of that happenstance in, mm. in the process. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of beautiful spontaneity that can come up, you know, working in public and with video as well. I know that, yeah, I've had a couple of experiences with it where things that you think are mistakes or, you know, surprises actually turn out to be these beautiful sort of transition points that, you know, the next time you grow from it and so on and so forth. But Spencer, both you and Freya have talked about this aspect of conversation that happens in public space with your works as well. Freya, I'm interested what, how important conversation is for you as part of process, either with yourself or with others. Yeah, I mean, with myself, very important. <laughs> a lot of, <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, a lot of my development is just writing and especially with works like this kind of scripting, I guess you call it. I don't really, I don't really call what I would do performance. I would, I have termed it in the past rehearsing um, and it's kind of, I don't know, a sense of me rehearsing different, different selves or different ideas. Uh, or approaches um, to the world. Uh, yeah, conversation is, I find it very useful when I talk to other people, but often it's um, quite specific people that I talk to about my work, often family, um, and I don't know how much of that is to do with uh, there being a, an existing conversation that's being built on. And I do find it hard sometimes to start from scratch that conversation, um, which I think is, again, just my... Uh, I'm very tightly wound, I guess, and the conversations that I'm having are very... Um, to me, they feel very faceted <laughs> or multifaceted. Uh, so I think that's why I've come to a point where the conversations tend to just be with, in terms of the works themselves, tend to just be with me because I can't expect anyone to have the patience to have those convoluted chats. Um, but when they're in public, I do quite like the fact that whenever you walk past, there's some aspect of it that you can kind of quickly take with you, <laughs> that you don't need to be involved in the whole kind of roiling mess of it. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and Sal, what, Priya and Tegan, is it 3.15-ish you wanted us to pause for questions and answers? Sure. sure? Okay, so maybe I'll make this one the last question for mm -hmm. you, Sal. <laughs> How exciting. <laughs> um, I think it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I've forgotten it now. <laughs> Um, I think what I did want to ask you though, Sal, was around this idea of softness and what defines it and what defines tenderness. I kind of come into this question and I think of, you know, the first prompt of radical softness and then this idea of soft pulse and I kind of immediately think of, I guess, politics and soft power and all these kind of things and how art makes a contribution towards the world in which we, which we live in, I think. And I really took some inspiration from Eleanor's curatorial rationale on this. But I just wanted to know from you how you kind of define it and enacted it in a way that sings to your sort of multidisciplinary practice. Mm. Um, I too really enjoyed the uh, curatorial brief, I should say. Um, how do I define it? I think probably in terms of uh, vulnerability. Um, that would be at the core of, of what I understand softness to be. Um, yeah, vulnerability. And that is actually, as far as I'm concerned, that's the function of uh, the art that I make. It's, it's a medium for my own vulnerability. It's, its job is to express that or to, to act as a kind of um, cipher, if you like, uh, to 
uh, translate what is effectively just some emotions, just some emotions, <laughs> listen to that, <coughs> my feelings, into something that can be received by other people um, and received in whatever way they, it, they, they be received. Um, that part of it is outside of my control, but um, making art for me, the, the medium, whether that's uh, a digital medium or uh, an analog medium, if I'm drawing pictures or printmaking or, or whatever it is I might be engaged in, it is a process of translation. Um, it's a process of translation of emotion to art. Um, and that process is an expression of vulnerability. Um, in that sense, the art itself has a kind of protective function for me. Um, it's, it protects me from uh, the motivation that created it. Does that make sense? Good answer. <laughs> yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so I'll, with time in mind, I'll pass it over to the floor for people to ask questions of either Freya, Sal, or Spencer, if there are any. Hi. Um, I find it because there is no violence there. It's apparent violence. There isn't any actual violence. Um, it's, it's play. Uh, what appears is what I think a lot of people might interpret as some of the affectations of violence. That might be a, a gnashing tooth or a rolling eye or something. But what's interesting to me is that those uh, affectations or those gestures are actually, they belong to joy and they belong to play, yeah. Completely abstract. <laughs> Earlier on, you were talking about um, how the abstract is, I suppose, is absorbed or how we get into relationship in, in our lived experience with the abstract. And I wonder whether you had any thoughts about that. Like, what is the, why did you choose abstraction rather than figuration or narrative or, you know, another, another thing altogether? Yeah, um, well, I kind of, I feel like we live in a time of abstraction, both on a kind of like formal level. We live within these gridded structures and, you know, we are kind of, the world that's designed around us is, I think, a expression of all these ideas that kind of emerge from modernist abstraction. But we also live within a world where we have these abstract structures like, you know, the financial system and, you know, more kind of like esoteric abstract structures. Um, you know, we don't grow our own food a lot of the time. There's this large kind of like network of food where we're kind of like abstracted away from the production. And so I kind of think of abstraction in that, that bigger sense. Um, and yeah, I kind of, reflect on uh, the world through that language of abstraction as a bit of a, like a feedback loop. I'm kind of taking, um, taking in the abstract world and then spitting it out again as an abstract form. And the other thing I quite like about abstraction is that it can be very open to interpretation by different viewers of it. Um, some people might recognise like forms that I've pulled from the world around us. Some people might just see shapes and colours and get an emotion from that. So it's kind of, it opens up, yeah, different kind of possibilities for, for viewing. Um, yeah, some people say, you know, abstraction was done and dusted in the 1950s or, you know, before that. But I feel like there's still a lot of potential to explore those ideas um, that were kind of started in that, that period. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, 
I actually, sorry, just want to ask a question too, if I may, of all three of you. Um, because, Spencer, I understand that your practice has, through COVID, changed a little bit as well, that you've moved more into this video work. And I'd like to understand from the three of you how your practices have been impacted by a global pandemic of unprecedented proportions. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, for me, I had, I lived in a very small Carlton place that you were kind of describing with no backyard, no space to paint, no space to, you know, create these works I was working before. And yeah, I had to just kind of embrace new ways of working and the way that we were mostly consuming art during the pandemic was on our phones in this like 16, nine vertical format so I'm like well if that's how we're experiencing art I might as well create art for that and so then I just I had a lot of time on my hands so I taught myself animation and <laughs> yeah. and kind of started making the work and now it's interesting to see it kind of yeah evolve into different forms from that little tiny screen and where it's kind of going now but yeah, it was kind of a blessing in disguise. <laughs> so is it the medium or the message? Well, it's a bit of both. <laughs> I, the early video works I did were kind of like playing with the 16.9 screen as well. So a lot of the animations use that. So it's like the message and the medium were kind of like tied together. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Spencer. Sal. Oh, uh, the pandemic. Um, a Sorry. lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's all coming back to me. Um, a lot of my work was very truncated, was really interrupted. I had a, a exhibition. I had, I had nearly an exhibition three times. Um, it's still yet to happen. I can't even remember what I was going to exhibit, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, three times I can't remember what I was going to exhibit. Um, I do a lot of work that has a performance outcome these days. Uh, that was obviously very difficult as in impossible um, to follow through with. Uh, so I've still got projects that have not been fully realised and completed that were started, you know, up to three years ago. Um, so those kind of things were just awkward and difficult and interrupting and uh, I, I, in some senses don't even know where to begin. Uh, but in other ways it was a good time for stop motion, yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, that any animation, as you would agree, is a very labour-intensive process. So it's the kind of thing that uh, lockdown, I guess, uh, is is friendly to. Um, I did a big sequence. I remade a sequence during one of our big lockdowns that was a part of the show that uh, we've just been travelling, which is a stop motion uh, all set on the moon in the Valley of Lost Things. So I retreated into the Valley of Lost Things for quite a lot of the pandemic time. It felt like a really good place mm. to be. It was very appropriate and I felt, I do feel lucky that I had access to the moon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rather than these people who move towards video work and the screen, I decided to become a painter uh, and spent quite a long, yeah, heaps of, the last two years just sitting in my studio dabbing at tiny things and it was really nice um, because I think in the past I often <laughs> had these really immense plans or like w whenever I conceptualised an artwork and it sounds fancy, I didn't mean it in a fancy way, um, it was always this kind of swirling enormous thing uh, that I would really struggle to realise and I'm not saying that I'm over that, but I think just being, like working on these very finite small things um, helped, I hope, and I think maybe that I will be able to make, yeah, just I, I, uh, be a bit more material about things, I think. So, I don't know, thank you, pandemic, maybe. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes. I have a question for Freya. Um, so I was very interested, first of all, I really appreciated your 
vulnerability and how you've expressed it on your journey um, through your art and as you continue to uncover your journey. Um, and I think that that's, you know, I, I see it as well throughout like, you know, also you spend a certain style as well in, in, in the art that you're producing. But my question to you, Freya, specifically was purely out of curiosity. Um, what, so you said that, you know, you're having a conversation with yourself through your art and you still, you know, it's, it's very me focused, which I think, you know, it's the beginning of all inspiration, but it begins from what's inside, right? But with your current piece right now, what is the conversation that you're having? And can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, because I want to be checking out all of your work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the conversation that I'm having is uh, <laughs> why do I want to make art? How can I continue to make art? How can I draw boundaries around it? That How can I find a place within these institutions that are so hard to shift um, and relationships that are very structured, um, how can I find a place that feels uh, well, like worthwhile or something or rewarding or, um, yeah, I don't know. And it is a very me-focused me thing. Like I make art that is very labour intensive which I don't need to, but for some reason am driven to. Um, <laughs> and I guess that's part of the question is like, why am I driven to do this? Um, and is there a way that I can do that? That is less, I think someone recently described my practice as self-flagellation. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I guess, is there a way that I can do it that keeps what is the driving force but makes it, I don't know, more manageable or something. Yes. I mean, I tend to just sit in places and scribble notes. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if that's becoming discomfortable, though. I think that it's more in reflection for me, like the idea of putting something in there and trying to come to terms with what I can give it, I guess. I don't know. Um, I think from my point of view, everything that I make is probably built upon the things that I have made previous to it. So it's an incremental uh, movement towards, I wouldn't say a position of being more brave, but being perhaps, perhaps l more willing to accept the consequences of what I create whatever they might be. So that does, uh, it just builds upon itself. That's not specific to any particular location or environment, but that's about being a practicing artist for me. Um, I, I always like to, f yeah, familiarize myself physically with a space if possible. Um, so, I mean, for the projection, I came down as soon as I found out what space I'd been kind of allocated just to experience it, but also to take practical things like measurements and things. But yeah, it kind of then helps me inform, like I kind of have an impression in my head when I'm working on the work of like where it's going to end up and the kind of people that, how they kind of move through the space as well. So for like this work, for example, I, you know, there's a lot of movement quite fast along that street. So I made my video work quite short. Each little section is only like a minute long because, you know, I wanted people to kind of be able to get as much of it 
in the short time that they're traveling through it. Whereas if, if it was in a gallery space where people are maybe spending a little bit more time, I maybe would have made the videos longer or, or something else. So the, the space kind of does feed into, into the work um, when I'm kind of, yeah, contemplating the final thing. But there is also, yeah, part of it where it just kind of, the work is feeding off itself as well. Um, it's, yeah, it's weird because you work on bodies of work for so long, like years at a time, and then the public part of it is often such a like tip of the iceberg of it, where, where it all kind of coalesces together for a short amount of time. And then after that, the work dissipates again, either back to your studio or you know, off into the world somewhere else. So um, yeah, it's a strange experience of an artist when, you, when it all gets put out into the public for that little brief window. <laughs> Okay, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Spencer, Sal, you. and Freya. A round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Round of applause for Chris, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thank you. We're just going to have a little break again and we will be joined by Susan Michael Forrester to, with a few other artists to talk about collaboration in about 15 minutes. We'll see you soon. <laughs>